We'd like to welcome Patrick Quillen, Dr. Patrick Quillen, um, here to Lancaster, Pennsylvania today. Um, he has 27 years of experience in clinical um, nutrition, 10 of which were spent as the Vice President of Nutrition for the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Dr. Quillen has appeared on over 40 television shows and 220 radio shows nationwide. He has written 15 books, including Beating Cancer with Nutrition, which I'm currently reading right now. So I'd like to welcome Patrick Quillen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Bonnie, Mary Noel, and Amanda and the whole team that invited me. You've got beautiful country here. Uh, nice green rolling hills and all that Amish stuff that I drove by coming the scenic route from Philly. And when I got my name tag this morning, I was uh, walking through the lobby and a lady who was staying here said, oh, what's going on here? I said, it's a nutrition cancer conference. Oh, I'm a big fan of nutrition, she said. As a matter of fact, I forgot my B12s at home. Do you think I can take two B6s instead? <laughs> Numbers sounded good to me. We're talking about beating cancer with nutrition. And what I will share with you in the next few minutes, let me start my timer, as she said. We're going to keep you on time. In the next few minutes is that I am an evolutionist, not a revolutionist. You are nutritionists, dietitians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals. And I'm not here to tell you you're going to have to go in and resign your position in good conscience. But what you can do is dramatically augment what's going on in your clinics and hospitals. Working as a team together, you will find that you can make, the, you can improve outcome in traditional oncology care. So I hope you feel like this is not going to ruin your career in the next hour and a half. <clears throat> a cute story that tells you what's going on in cancer treatment in this country. <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes, the famous private investigator, was out having uh, camping with his famous companion, Dr. John Watson. And the two of them shared a bottle of wine and a meal cooked over an open fire and tucked themselves into their tent for a good night's sleep. And in the middle of the night, Sherlock elbows Watson and he says, Watson, look up. What do you see? Why, well, I see millions and millions of stars. Very good, Watson. And what does that mean? So he puts on his analytical mind now. Why? Meteorologically, I believe that means we'll have fair weather tomorrow. I believe that astronomically, we're on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, hurtling our way through space. Astrologically, it means that we're in Mercury and Venus rising. And theologically, I believe that means that God is vast in all of his creations. Very good, Watson. What does it mean to you, Holmes? Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> There's a very good meaning to this when we will talk about in cancer treatment in this country, at least 40% of the patients are dying of malnutrition. We got tumor derived activated killer cells, we got uh, proton beam therapy, we've got intensity modulated radiation therapy, we got fractionated chemo, we've got a two Actually, it's a $2 trillion health care system in this country. $200 billion is spent on cancer treatment. A lot of it is wonderful, exotic technology, and we ignore the obvious. Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. Doctor, the patient is dying of malnutrition. You may be curing the cancer, but they're dying of something so simple that we can help with. So before we're through, I hope to get you to a point of saying, I can go in and augment what's going on in our clinic and hospital. So the sound bites are... A well-nourished cancer patient can better manage the disease. And a healthy human body is self-regulating and self-repairing. These sound self-evident, but they're not as obvious as they should be in our healthcare system. Healthy human body is self-repairing is self and self-regulating. This is autonomous homeostasis. You learned it in Biology 101A. Somehow the body regulates itself. The good news and bad news here in cancer treatment. It's like the pilot told me on the intercom when I was flying out here. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we're lost. But the good news is we're making very good time. <laughs> cancer treatment. The bad news is that cancer is growing in of almost epidemic proportions in this country. The good news is cancer has been with us since the dawn of time. And we have within us homeostatic self-regulating mechanisms that we can upregulate to improve outcome in the cancer patient. Fact is, how many of you in this room have ever had cancer? Diagnosed palpable cancer. 
half dozen, okay. And you're here, so you're doing fairly well, that's good. You realize all of you have had cancer. According to the statistics, all adults have had about six cases of cancer that their body figured out and beat. And that's why you're here in good shape and not in a cancer hospital. So we'll move ahead here. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, this is the facility I worked in in Chicago for 10 years. Facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That was my headquarters there. We had Celebrate Life reunions. Uh, Two-thirds of our patients who came there were refractory, meaning they had failed therapy at some other clinic. And we would have a Celebrate Life reunion in which you bring back people who have five years beyond their diagnosis, which is the official definition of a cure, according to the American Cancer Society. And we had planted over 900 trees by the time I left the organization, and there are many, many more going. So we were doing something different. How is it that they failed therapy at Cancer A, and they came to us, and sometimes we were Cancer C or D, tertiary quaternary hospital, and we could resurrect some of these people. Nutrition was a big part of that. Common misconceptions among oncologists. Myth, nutrition has nothing to do with cancer. Fact, the health of all plants and animals is heavily dependent on nutrition. Nutrition will influence the outcome of cancer. Myth, antioxidants are both expensive urine and will neutralize the benefits of chemo and radiation. Fact, then why are the antioxidant prescription drugs, amifostine, which is used for cisplatinum, mesna, dextrazazone, why are they used with chemo and we know that they help? They reduce the toxicity. They're antioxidant drugs. Why not use an antioxidant nutrient that your body is more familiar with? Uh, myth, sugar has nothing to do with cancer outcome. Then why is the $1.5 million PET scan considered such a valuable tool in diagnosing cancer? What they do is they inject radioactively labeled sugar into the veins of a cancer patient. Then they use a Geiger counter-like scanning device to say where did the sugar go because cancer is a sugar feeder. We've known that since uh, Warburg got his Nobel Prize in 1930. And then they find out where the cancer is. PET scan is used to find where the cancer sites are because it's a sugar feeder. It's an obligate glucose metabolizer. More on that as we move on. Paradigm shifts take time. The world is flat. I don't think so. What you can't see can't hurt you. I don't think so. The USDA food pyramid plus recommended dietary allowance nutrition equals good health. Maybe not. Cancer is irreversible. Therapies must lead to highly toxic. Maybe not. The germ is nothing. The terrain is everything. Pasteur in his deathbed, after battling all the bacteria, the microbes, he came up with pasteurization. Let's cook them. He found, you know, you can't kill all of them. What you have to do is improve the terrain. The terrain is us. Where does the bug or the cancer land? And so it's the terrain that will make the big difference in this battle. So my outline, here's where we're headed. We're going to talk about the cancer of our dysfunctional health care in America. Cancer is a disease in America. Nutrition improves outcome in medically treated cancer patients with these five main points, prevent or reverse malnutrition, reduce toxicity of chemo and radiation without reducing the efficacy of the drugs, and we'll see that in great detail. Bolster immune functions, regulate blood glucose, and nutrients work as biological response modifiers. What should the patient eat? Are supplements of value? Comprehensive cancer treatment should include nutrition. That's where we're headed. A healthy human body is self-regulating and self-repairing. What we are trying to do is remove the blocks to health, and that is toxins, stress, electromagnetic fields, infections, a caveat here and a disclaimer and an apology. I've got at least 400 slides that would have been relevant and current for today. I had to boil them down to 150. And then when I uh, up, uh, uploaded my file to the uh, med center, I had to de get it down to closer to 70 or 80. So what you've got in your handout is 70 or 80. What you will have archived from my presentation is all of them. And so don't feel like you're going to be left out. Uh, infections. We need to provide the essential nutrients, psycho-spiritual support, exercise, energy alignment, and a well-nourished cancer patient can better manage the disease. It's a fact. That's where we're headed. Etiology for most diseases. If we agree that no one with a headache is suffering from a deficiency of aspirin, <laughs> and no one with breast cancer has a deficiency of adriamycin, right? So we know that if you change the underlying cause of a disease, you can improve the outcome in that disease. Instead of just palliating symptoms or beating back a brush fire, we need to find out where did the fire start. 
So with that in mind, etiology, the diagnosed disease that you see here in America, they all have an ICD-9 billing code, and then we have a protocol, and we say, well, heart disease, we're going to give them statins or a stent or bypass surgery. Nobody ever asks, well, what happened? How did they get it? But we're going to come back to this. There are at least 14 known daggers of arterial disease. We know, for instance, excess homocysteine will cause heart disease. And you can do everything you want with stents and shunts and surgery, but unless you lower homocysteine by using folate and B12, you ain't going to get any progress. Uh, excess insulin, low HDL, high glucose, nitric oxide deficit, low vitamin K, uh, fibrinogen, testosterone, these are all the underlying factors that drive uh, the problem in heart disease. And therefore, let's go back to our little... So, what we're trying to do then is change the uh, underlying factors. Infections, inflammation, hypercoagulability or sticky blood. Americans have got blood that runs like ketchup. It should run like red wine. That's the viscosity. So if you did an INR or a protime of a healthy person, it's very different than someone who was living off of sugar and the wrong fats. And then the surgeon says, it's a bleeder. No, it's a normal, healthy person. But maybe we better allow for that based upon doing a pro-time before you do surgery. Um, dysbiosis, the gut. We'll talk more about that. Hypothyroidism, maldigestion. Just because you eat it doesn't mean you're digesting it. Uh, and that includes things like celiac or gluten sensitivity, where, which are much more common than the one out of 5,000 they told me about when I was an undergrad. It's now closer to maybe one out of 100, maybe even more than that. Uh, moving ahead, immune dysfunctions, hyperglycemia, allergies, hormone imbalances, oxidative stress, acidosis, and these are driven by these primary etiology factors. Nutrition, infections, exercise, attitude, toxins, energy alignment, and genetic vulnerability. If you pull out the weed by the root, you got it. If you cut off the weed at ground level, you may have made it stronger. And that's what we're talking about with changing underlying causes. So we talked about, in heart disease, we know this is true. In cancer, it is also true, a separate set of risk factors that we need to change. And I couldn't uh, resist the temptation here. Since we're near Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I'm a big fan of dark chocolate, don't get me wrong here, if you've got at least 60% cacao beans in it, you've got yourself, med uh, this is botanical medicine. So I'm not against chocolate, but with that in mind, welcome to the PMS, Premenstrual Syndrome Diner. Our special today is Hershey Bar Lasagna. That comes with M&M soup and mashed Snickers with hot fudge gravy. 